What's up, if you have a penny? Today, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to do the questions that are in the CED. So this is question number one. It's on gene expression and evolution. In many countries, mosquitoes are responsible for transmitting the parasite that causes malaria to people through their bite. A primary tool for mosquito control is the use of nets sprayed with chemicals known as pyrethroids, which are relatively safe for people but toxic to mosquitoes. However, mosquito resistance to these chemicals has now become widespread. The chemical interferes with the function of the transmembrane sodium channel found in cells of mosquitoes. In one common mutation to the channel protein, a phenylalanine is substituted for a leucine amino acid position 1014. Scientists hypothesize that this mutation is responsible for some cases of the resistance. To investigate that resistance, mosquitoes were collected four times over a two-year period from two different following regions. Scientists exposed the collected mosquitoes to filter paper soaked in two different insecticides, deltamethrin and paramethrin. The percent mortality of the mosquitoes was determined after 24 hours. Scientists simultaneously determined whether leucine or phenylalanine was encoded in position 1014 by each of the two copies of the sodium channel. And here we can see, of course, our figure two. You can see there's four different uh, times that they collected the data. And you can see that percent mortality. And you also can see some error bars. They also give us table one. Show us the frequency of the leucine and the phenylalanine um, at that position, 1014. You can see who's homozygous for leucine, who's heterozygous for both, or who's homozygous for phenylalanine. So part A is always asking us a biology question. Describe the most likely cause of the amino acid substitution in the sodium channel. So how did I go from having one amino acid to having a different amino acid? Well, that's just a change in your DNA. Traditionally, this is the point mutation in which one nucleotide is changed. Um, and so this would be considered a missense mutation because that one uh, nucleotide change that then leads to a different amino acid being substituted, and that's a missense mutation. Explain how the substitution of a single amino acid in the channel protein could cause resistance in mosquitoes. And so we have to think about the structure of a protein. There's a primary structure that won't change. Secondary structure, that really doesn't change. So what we're really looking at is the tertiary structure and the quaternary structure. So the tertiary structure gives you that three-dimensional structure of that uh, protein or that polypeptide. And so what we see is that if we switch out one amino acid for another, we could cause the entire shape of that polypeptide of that protein to change, um, which could then give it a different function. So substitution could change the shape of the protein channel, so the chemicals can no longer affect it, bind to it, or interfere with its function. Part B asks us to identify the dependent variable in the experiment whose data was graphed in figure two. So if we go back here and we look at figure two, you kind of see that you've got your time on your uh, your y-axis, and you can see the percent mortality on your x. And so students traditionally just look at that y-axis, so I do want to warrant you to pay attention to your prompt and not just look at the graph. Um, and so if you look at the prompt, it tells us that the um, percent mortality of mosquitoes was determined after 24 hours. That tells us that's the collected data. That is what is being dependent on those changes of those insecticides. And so your dependent variable is actually the percent mortality or how susceptible it is to the insecticide. Then we have to say, okay, well, what about identifying the positive control in the experiment? Positive control is going to be something that we know is going to happen, something we expect to happen when we then give it the treatment group. Um, and so this would be the strain that's susceptible to the insecticide. So we know that the strain that is susceptible should die. So I should see that that is going to happen in my experiments. That's going to be my positive control. And then justify exposing some of the mosquitoes to untreated filter paper each time. So if you put filter paper in there, and you put the insecticides in there, you don't know whether the uh, mosquito is responding to the insecticide or to the filter paper. And so by having untreated filter paper in there, it allows us to see that the experiment is due to the, um, or the experimental results are due to the treatment group, not due to the filter paper. So exposing mosquitoes to untreated filter paper confirms that any observed mortality is from the insecticides rather than the filter paper itself or any of the other experimental conditions. Part C is based on the data in figure two. Describe whether mosquitoes from the region A or region B are more likely to exhibit greater evolutionary fitness if exposed to the chemical in their native environment over the time period of the experiment. So we want to look just at um, that chemical, and we want to look at both regions. So I've kind of circled this just to kind of help us out. And if we're looking for evolutionary fitness, fitness means that they're more likely to survive and more likely to pass on that gene to their offspring, who will also be more likely to survive. And so if I'm looking for survivability, 
I'm more looking for there to be a low percent mortality. So if you look here, we can see that in region A, there's a low mortality, but in region B, there's a high mortality. Um, and so mosquitoes from region A are more likely to survive to reproduce. So region A mosquitoes will have greater evolutionary fitness. Based on the data in figure two, describe any significant change in the susceptibility of mosquitoes from region B to each of the two insecticides over the two year period. So now we're just looking over here at the region B section of this graph. Now, I do find this question a little bit hard to understand because of the fact that we're not really seeing the bottom of these error bars, um, but they're wanting there to be significant change. Significant change means that the error bars are not overlapping. And so if I look here at the parametherin, um, I can see that there's not really a lot of significant changing until I get to June 2010. Um, so there's a slight change, but not really anything significant until we get to June 10. Um, and then here, when I look at um, the delta methyrin, I can see that there is a overarching kind of, it decreases in every single kind of time point. Um, and so for the uh, paramethrin, there's little significant change in susceptibility until June 2010 tests when the mosquitoes were significantly less susceptible than they had been in previous three tests. For the delta methrin, there was a significant decrease in susceptibility from June 20, 2009 to October 2000. I'm on the wrong one. <laughs> from June 2009, October 2009, and then a significant decrease from uh, until we get to 2010. And so you can kind of see that those error bars did not overlap. And because those error bars didn't overlap, we did see that significant decrease each time from those ones. So we then need to calculate the uh, frequency of the allele coding for the phenylalanine in each population in October of 2008, and then round your answers to two decimal places. So here's this graph. And they want us to look at October 2008 in both regions. So we're going to look at this one, and we're going to look at this one. And so I'm going to do those on a separate slide just to kind of help us see the graph, I'm sorry, the data, and see the calculation at the same time. So let's first look at region A in 2008 in October. So they want us to calculate the phenylalanine for that position. So that means I have to count the alleles. I know that my total mosquitoes is 39. I know that the amount of leucine or homozygous leucine would be um, three. Um, the ones that are heterozygous is five. And the ones that are homozygous for phenylalanine is 31. So in order to count my phenylalanine alleles and find that frequency, um, I'm going to have to count the amount that are homozygous and multiply by that by two. And then the amount that are heterozygous multiplied by one, because this one's going to have one phenylalanine allele, while this one will have two phenylalanine alleles. And then I'll multiply the total mosquitoes by two, because each of our mosquitoes is going to have two alleles, because they're diploid. Um, so then I'm going to substitute that in, two times 31, because those ones were homozygous, um, plus the one uh, type, sorry, plus the five that were heterozygous times one, and then I'm gonna divide by the 39 times two. That gives me 62 plus five over 78. So that's 67 over 78, which gives me 0.859. They then ask us to put it to two decimal places. That would be 0.86 to be in region A. And so here's what's actually on my scoring guidelines. They did give you a little bit of um, range depending on how you may have rounded that question. So part B, same thing. We're going to do the same exact calculation, two times phenylalanine, sorry, homozygous for phenylalanine, plus the one that are heterozygous divided by two times the total of the mosquitoes. So two times two, because of the fact that there are two that are homozygous, plus there are five that are heterozygous, divided by two times 27, because there's only 27 mosquitoes. That gives me four plus five over 54, which gives me nine over 54, which gives me 0.167. So again, we have to give that to two decimal places. So that's 0.17. And then here is the uh, scoring guideline. They had 0.16 through 0.17 to give you a little bit of range for that rounding issues. Part D is so using mosquitoes from the insecticide free areas. The scientists developed mosquito strains with amino acid substitution at each other positions in the sodium channel. They expose the mosquito strain to the non-insecticides, predict the susceptibility of the mosquitoes to those insecticides. And so what we're seeing is that if we had different positions. So we're not seeing the exact same position for the mutation. They're now going to be susceptible to that insecticide. So all the mosquitoes are going to die. All of them will be susceptible because it was only at this one specific place that we saw that they were um, going to have that mutation change or the mutation that caused the change in their amino acid substitution. So then we have to, uh, where are we at? The scientists claim that the mosquito population of region B evolved resistance over a period of the experiment, and that resistance arose as a result of immigration of resistant mosquitoes from other regions. Based on the data in table one and the information provided, provide evidence to support the scientist's claim. So they're claiming that there must have been an influx of other mosquitoes. And that's why we see the changes here. 
So if we were to calculate the um, amount of phenylalanine, we already calculated that one in October is 0.17. But if we were to calculate it for June of 2010, where we're seeing this change over time, we see that now we're at 0.5. So we see that there's been a significant change to this, which would only come from the fact that there may have been immigration. So the frequency of the phenylalanine increased from very low to much higher, so 0.17 to 0.5, before population B mosquitoes that came from an area of low insecticide use. So they didn't really have a lot of insecticides in uh, population B, and so so the reason why we would now see this changing is because there must have been ones that were resistant that moved in. Thus, the insecticide use is not selected for those mosquitoes with the phenylalanine. It is more likely that the resistant mosquitoes with the phenylalanine allele are immigration to the area, thus increasing the frequency of the allele in that population. Hope that this helpful. Remember, hate penguins are just success.